put us to death. Talking about my generation. Just because we get around. Talking about my generation. Things ain't do look awful. Talking about my generation. I hope I die before I get old. Perhaps you've seen the latest edition, the September edition of JW Broadcasting, in which a governing body member, David Splain, tries to explain uh, what a generation is. You would think it would be simple enough, but uh, it's proved to be rather excruciatingly difficult for Jehovah's Witnesses to come to terms with what a generation is. For a long time, leading up to 1995, Jehovah's Witnesses felt like a generation was 70 or 80 years. And that's because Moses said that the days of our lives are 70 or 80 if we're especially strong. So 1995 was the outside limit of that 80 years. And uh, over these past 20 years, the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses have been coming up with different explanations for what a generation is. Uh, they trotted out a few years ago an, an explanation that because Jesus used the expression uh, a wicked and adulterous generation, that a generation was wicked and adulterous. But then I think they realized that that didn't really fit with what Jesus was saying. This generation will not pass away until all of these things occur. And so now the latest uh, iteration is that this generation is really several generations, but if they overlap, it's one continuous. <laughs> oh, it's excruciating to watch. But they're determined because they are committed to this idea that Jesus began ruling in 1914. And if you notice in the broadcast, uh, they mentioned that Brother Franz and the Anointed Brothers in 1913, 1914, they knew exactly uh, what had happened once World War I began. They knew. And that's not really true. I don't think most of Jehovah's Witnesses realize that for 40 years prior to 1914, the Watchtower taught that the presence of Christ had already begun that it began in 1874. And they continued to teach that long after 1914, uh, all the way up until almost the beginning of World War II. So to claim that they knew exactly what was going on is uh, a lie. Uh, they expected Armageddon to occur shortly after 1914. In fact, uh, Brother McMillan, Brother Mac, as they called him, who was uh, one of the Bethelites that went to prison with uh, Rutherford in uh, 1918. <laughs> they were so confident that they were going to be raptured, I guess they believed in something similar to that. Uh, they sold their winter coats in the summer of 1914. And... Of course, they had to buy new garments, I suppose, uh, or go cold and <laughs> for the next successive winters. But anyway, it, it's not my intention to heap ridicule upon them. But I would like to explain to Jehovah's Witnesses and interested persons uh, what's going on here with this. For one thing, the entire seven times chronology that starts at 607 and ends in 1914 with Jesus becoming king, most of Jehovah's Witnesses are convinced that that is an undeniable proof that Christ began ruling in 1914. But if you thoughtfully consider what Jesus said in the 21st chapter of Luke, and that's the only gospel account where Jesus mentioned the appointed times of the nations. And those appointed times of the nations apply to the trampling of Jerusalem. Well, the Watchtower claims the trampling of Jerusalem began when 
Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem five centuries earlier, before Christ. But that could not possibly be what Jesus had in mind. If you recall, a few days before he spoke about the conclusion, he had entered Jerusalem for the very last time. He viewed the city from afar and he wept and he pronounced judgment upon it. He said, uh, not a stone would be left upon a stone and not be thrown down. Well, the apostles were really stunned by this. And so they asked Jesus privately on the Mount of Olives, tell us, when will these things be? So he told them these signs. And he said, then you will see a disgusting thing standing where it ought not. That's your signal to flee from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem would be destroyed. And it was in that very same context. And Jerusalem will be trampled on by the nations until the appointed times of the nations are fulfilled. Would the apostles ever have imagined that Jesus was telling them that J Jerusalem was already being trampled? <laughs> There's not a chance. Yet that's exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And that's what the Watchtower insists is absolutely what Jesus meant, although it should be clear to anyone who reads what Jesus said and who has some knowledge of history and the context in which Jesus spoke about Jerusalem being trampled, there is po no possibility that he inferred that Babylon had already begun trampling Jerusalem. And it's true that there had been no king sitting upon the throne, and that's the whole basis for Jehovah's Witnesses to believe that the end of that trampling would, would see that this kingdom come to power. But uh, the trampling didn't begin according to what Jesus was saying with the destruction that Nebuchadnezzar wrought. So anyway, what, what is it with uh, this generation? Well, you notice uh, Brother Splain took us to the 24th chapter of Matthew and the illustration that Jesus gave where in the 32nd verse, Jesus said, now, learn this illustration from the fig tree. Just as soon as its young branch grows tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is near. Likewise, also, you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the door. So uh, Brother Splain gave an illustration about a child. He can see a leaf on a tree, but he, he wouldn't understand necessarily that it signifies that summer is near. But an adult would because of their reasoning ability, <laughs> supposedly. But consider what he's asking you to believe. That those brothers in 1913 up to 1914 who were alive then and they saw world war one that was the first leaf of the fig tree heralding summer that jesus is near at the door and that was over 100 years ago so when you see all these things know that you're going to pass away and 100 years later <laughs> People will still be waiting for summer. <laughs> Do you think that's what Jesus meant? He said, when you see all these things, have you seen all these things? Even the things that Jehovah's Witnesses believe have occurred in fulfillment of prophecy, have you personally seen it? Wouldn't we expect that Jesus expected his disciples to literally see these things not to have somebody tell them yes there was a great war a century ago and there was a spanish influenza that killed millions and millions of people and you can read about it in a history book or an encyclopedia is that how you see it of course in the first century the apostles that asked Jesus that question, uh, no doubt most of them, many of them at least, were still alive 
when the Roman armies came and began to besiege Jerusalem. And they saw the disorders and the wars that led up to that. And for those that were in Jerusalem, they could have seen the Roman legions come. They saw all of these things. They didn't have to be told that all of these things started to occur before they were born, generations before they came on the scene. Not only that, Brother Splain's uh, explanation, he intimates that we have seen all of these things except the Great Tribulation. But is that true? Is that even what the Watchtower teaches? And again, the answer is no. They're not being uh, straightforward. Uh, for one thing, let's, let's back up here. Um, Jesus said that um, because of the increasing of lawlessness, the love of the greater number will, will grow cold. That's in verse 12. Now, it used to be that Jehovah's Witnesses would point to the skyrocketing crime rate, and that's the increasing of lawlessness. But in the Bible, and according to Jesus, lawlessness has to do with hypocrisy and apostasy, lawlessness against God. For example, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would say to those who claim they uh, prophesied in his name, he would say to them, get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Did that mean that they were yeah, street criminals or <laughs> thieves or whatever? No. It had to do with their being lawless towards God, not subjecting themselves to God's law. Well, Paul spoke of a man of lawlessness who would operate within Christ's congregation, which is uh, a figurative temple. So it stands to reason that this man of lawlessness would be the source of lawlessness. And I've mentioned this in a number of videos and articles. What does the man of lawlessness promote? A false parousia. Read the context. I won't go into it again here. Uh, sound like I'm repeating myself. Uh, but the lawlessness, the increasing of lawlessness must be within Christ's congregation. And the love of the greater number will grow cold, would pertain to Christians. And I think we're seeing an increase of lawlessness among Jehovah's Witnesses particularly as it regards the horrific way in which uh, child abuse has been mishandled by the leadership. That's one stark example. But Jesus also said there in that same context, many will be stumbled and will betray one another and will hate one another. And elsewhere, Jesus said that children will hand their parents over to be put to death. Parents will hand their children over to be put to death. Have we seen that? That's among all these things. When you see all these things, well, we haven't really seen that, have we? We haven't seen that sort of horrific persecution. In the 21st chapter of Luke, Jesus said that uh, men will become faint out of fear in expectation of the things coming upon uh, the world. The Watchtower used to say that the climate of fear that was prevalent among uh, the nations was in fulfillment of that prophecy. And now they say that's not true. It's something future. And Jesus said that <laughs> in, in that context, uh, that men will become fade out of fear due to the roaring of the sea, not knowing the way out. Again, they used to say, well, yeah, that's the, all the chaos that began in 1914. Now they admit that this is a future event, a, a great chaos of civilization. So have we seen any of these things? Well, the Watchtower insisted, yes, we saw war, 
Well, somebody saw a war 100, 100 years ago, and that's... It's interesting. <laughs> In conclusion, Brother Splain's conclusion was... Well, let's listen to it. So, brothers... We are indeed living deep in the time of the end. Now is no time for any of us to get weary. So let's all heed Jesus' counsel, the counsel found at Matthew 24, 42. Keep on the watch, therefore, because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. I'd like to ask you a question now. Do you think focusing on something that happened before you were born probably before your parents were born, maybe before your grandparents were born. Do you think fixating on a date, 1914, and a war that has largely been forgotten helps you to stay in anticipation of the coming of Christ? About 10 years ago, and the first edition of Jehovah himself has become king, I pointed forward to a third world war. A war the Watchtower says cannot possibly happen because a third world war would be a nuclear war and it wouldn't leave anybody alive. So we know that the sign that Jesus foretold, it has to have already begun back in 1914. There can't be another world war. But if you're awake to what's happening currently in our world, you can't help but notice that the nations are heading towards a world war and a nuclear confrontation. I post uh, news items on pretty much a daily basis on my Twitter feed from reputable news sources, uh, from government officials and world leaders who are trying to avert a world war. Well, actually, some are promoting it and some are trying. But the question is, why doesn't, for instance, JW Broadcasting use their platform to alert Jehovah's Witnesses to what's happening in their world? Isn't that how we would stay awake in expectation of the coming of Christ? Actually, we are witnessing an extraordinary fulfillment of a prophecy. Not what Jesus foretold. I expect nation to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, food shortages, earthquakes, pestilence, all those things to occur in a short period of time in the near future. That's the beginning, pangs of distress. And you will live to see the end of it with, with great tribulation. And it won't cover a century or a decade even. But we're witnessing at this present time the fulfillment of a number of prophecies. I mentioned the man of lawlessness, certainly. But in the 13th chapter of Ezekiel, of course it was, had a, an ancient setting, but it has that relevance for us today because it speaks to those living, who will be living in the final part of the days. But Jehovah pronounced woe to those whom he called the stupid prophets. And they envisioned false visions and they foretold a lie. Uh, this is Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 6. He says, they have seen false visions and foretold a lie. Those who are saying, the word of Jehovah is, when Jehovah himself has not sent them. And they have waited for their word to come true. Is it not a false vision that you have seen and a lie that you have foretold when you say, the word of Jehovah is, when I have not said anything? Well, hasn't the watchtower waited for their word to come true? Brother Franz saw the significance of this sign in 1914, and now a century has gone by and they're still waiting for a word to come true. Well, Jehovah told his watchman, Ezekiel, to say to these prophets that their wall will fall. They plastered 
a flimsy partition wall with whitewash, coat after coat, which is exactly what the Watchtower has done, trying to explain their 1914, re-explaining again and again and again, coat after coat of whitewash. And Jehovah says, tell those plastering with whitewash that it will fall. A torrential downpour will come. Hailstones will fall and powerful windstorms will break it down. And when the wall falls, you will be asked, where is your coating of plaster? When World War erupts, that will be the hailstone that will knock down the Watchtower's 1914 hoax. And there will be no plastering that will be able to patch it up then.